So, so far we have talked about uh, filtration. Now it's time to go into membrane filtration. Uh, so in membrane filtration, you typically have cross flow, meaning that it's not just one inflow, one outflow, it's actually one inflow and two outflows. Uh, while in filtration, it's usually dead end filtration. So you have an inflow and all the, the flow goes through uh, the cake and the filter. And in microfiltration, it might actually be dead end or cross flow. So in membrane filtration, you don't want a uh, cake to build up and then you have a cross flow to, to shear away uh, the a cake uh, that forms. Common features, well, in both cases, you have porous semi-permeable membra uh, barriers or membranes. Uh, you typically have laminar flow uh, through this barrier, especially in membrane filtration, you definitely have laminar flow. Uh, you separate, separate uh, according to size, and you have a driving force, which is the pressure applied across the membrane. And the simplified symbol in both cases it looks like this. So a square with a dotted line across the diagonal. So in membrane filtration, you have cross flow. So you have a, field, a feed coming in and then a retentate going out with the things that didn't pass through the, the membrane and then a permeate with whatever passed through the membrane. And the retention is the fraction remaining. So, uh, so what comes, what doesn't come out with the permate. So let's try to do a mass balance for the liquid and the solute. And you, and you can pause here to try to think for yourself for a while what this will look like. Okay, uh, we think of a steady state case, so in equals out. And for the liquid, you have a V zero that comes in and the volume coming out is the volume of the retentate plus the volume of the permeate. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, while the particles, you have to take care of the, uh, take into account the concentration in all these volumes. Uh, so V zero uh, has a concentration of C zero and the the retentate has a concentration of CR and the permeate has a concentration of CP. And uh, one often talks about the volume reduction and that's VP divided by V0. Uh, the observed retention is one minus CP divided by CB. Uh, and oops, we have now a new thing here. CB doesn't appear up here, right? You have C0, CR, and CP there. Mm, well, what's CB? Well, CB is the concentration on the feed side. And well, uh, the feed side here, well, it might actually vary <laughs> along the membrane here. Uh, so what we know is that the CB is uh, somewhere between C0 and CR. And depending on the setup, uh, we might have different cases and we will often assume that CB actually equals CR because we will assume that there is a feedback thing going on here. Uh, so the retentate goes multiple passes uh, across the membrane before finally getting out. So what does the membrane look like? Well, in microfiltration, it's typically just a homogeneous membrane uh, with some hole, uh, holes in it. Uh, uh, you can think of just a piece of um, some solid and that you have punched holes in, which you, you could do with a laser, for example. In ultrafiltration, you typically have an asymmetric membrane. So you have tiny openings that opens up to something larger to reduce the resistance. Because if you have the same the tiny diameter of the channel all the way through, you would have an enormous uh, Fric uh, friction against this uh, the surface here. Uh, so if it opens up, it becomes much better. And you much uh, you mu uh, probably need also a support structure uh, to make this a more sturdy material. And so the support structure is not there to 
uh, to filter anything or be like that, but just to make this thin membrane a bit more rigid uh, to be able to cope with things. If uh, the mo molecule diameter is less uh, than the pore molecule, uh, the sieving mechanism is often what can be used as to describe what actually happens here. So the retention is one minus, and then a big parenthesis, one minus the molecule divided by d pore, and uh, end of the parenthesis, and then squared. Uh, so uh, some of the molecules will not have time to actually pass through while this flow is flowing across the membrane. In reverse osmosis, uh, which is uh, the finest uh, membrane, uh, then you act actually have an active layer up here, which could actually be without any holes whatsoever. Uh, so a thin thing, uh, and uh, things need to be soluble in this layer to pass through. And then you have a support layer, which looks a bit like uh, the ultrafiltration membrane. And then uh, below that you have a support structure, which could be non-woven or ceramic or something like that. So the separation mechanism here is not what we had before, the sieving mechanism, but rather uh, it depends on diffusion and solubility inside this active layer. So why is this important? Why do we care? Why, why should we study membrane filtration? Well, there are plenty of different uh, applications. Uh, uh, so, and there are applications where the permate is the product and there are applications where, where the retentate is the product. Uh, in food industry, there is plenty of uh, membrane filtration units. Uh, if you, for example, want to uh, make milk that contains no uh, lactose, uh, then you typically use membrane filtration. Uh, and um, you have various different. Uh, and, and membrane filtration is often very much used in industry to reduce the environmental impact. So you can have a stream uh, that is going to uh, water treatment system uh, but to take away things before going to the water treatment system, you might introduce a barrier and uh, like a membrane. And perhaps the, that's the product that you can send back, uh, purify, or it could be unreacted uh, reactants that you can send back. Or it might be pollutants uh, that were created in the process. So there are plenty of different, and I would recommend you to sit down and think uh, of what kind of situations uh, are there where the permit is the product and where the retentate is the product.